Hello everybody, welcome back to the lecture on polymer science and processing. This week we want to look into the synthesis of radicals by uh, of polymers by free radical polymerization, which as you will see is known as a chain growth polymerization. Before going there, let me briefly recap what we learned last week. We looked into step growth polymerization and especially nonlinear step growth polymerization. And we saw that if we have monomers that have two A functionalities and three or more B functionalities, A can only react with B, then we will eventually form a network because of the branching by these B branching points that will eventually kind of convert into a network, by a network because it connects to other polymer chains. Then we saw a couple of examples of such um, polymer networks and we saw that especially if we have equal amounts of A and B polymers, these become very hard and insoluble and mechani mechanically stable materials because we have so many cross-linking points in the material and this is for example found in epoxy glues that are very um, robust and very, very hard glues or in uh, very old types of materials like bakelite or also in more flexible materials such as silicone. So you see that these polymer networks actually have quite a lot of applications. We looked a little bit into the theoretical treatment as well. And now we want to change gears a little bit. We will stay in the realm of polymer chemistry, but we want to look at the second really important and fundamental way of making polymers. And this is chain growth polymerization. So first we want to look a little bit in the principle and also compare it to step growth polymerization. Then we will look at the synthetic aspects of free radical polymerization, so how it actually works, what needs to be done to make a polymer by radical polymerization. And then we look into the kinetics of the free radical polymerization. So we want to be able to predict or to make assessments on how long our polymer chains are or how fast our reaction is. Um, using experimental parameters that we can control at the beginning, such as monomer concentration, initiator concentration, and so on. And finally, we will look into what is known as the Tromstorff effect that teaches you a little bit of a lesson what, you, what happens if you overdo, if you're over zealous in tuning your polymer conditions. Okay, let's first start with chain growth or the principle of chain growth polymerization, especially compared to step growth polymerization. So you can where we fundamentally maybe look at polymerizations in two different ways. The first one that we saw in step growth polymerization is, if you want, the gentle and peaceful way. A reaction occurs between molecules that have two functional groups, and we can picture this with kind of me having two hands. And what now happens is that if I sit with you in the classroom and I extend my hand to one of you, you grab the hand, then we form a bond. And I can do this in two sides, so suddenly there is three of us connected. And now slowly but steadily, as you kind of shake hands with your neighbors, which you probably don't do at the moment because of the corona situation, but never mind. So you form more and more first dimers, then you form trimers, then slowly but steadily the hand extends through the room and we get longer and longer polymers. This is a step growth polymerization. Each reaction occurs individually. This is why you have small, uh, certain clusters of small chains throughout the classroom and only at the very last step, eventually a chain of hands kind of reaches throughout the room, which tells you that we have polymerized our well, classroom completely. Well, the second way on how we could, can make polymers, which is um, the chain growth principle, is something very different. Now picture me standing here and now I'm heating up a metal ball on a fire until it becomes really, really hot. So now we have a species with a very high energy. And now, if I touch this sphere, I will burn my fingers. So I do not want to touch this a very long time. So what I will do is I will toss this to the next person. So the next person will automatically catch it, realize now it's very hot, so this person will have a very high energy, and it will want to try to pass the energy on to the next person. And now, very rapidly, you will see I throw one ball in, and it will very quickly penetrate through the classroom and polymerize all people that touched it until somebody, if you want, is smart enough to just drop it on the floor, then the termination is finished. Uh, the polymerization is finished or is terminated. And now you can imagine if you do the same thing in a football stadium where there's much more monomers, it's the same thing. You toss in one single ball, automatically you burn a lot of fingers. And that already teaches you a very important lesson about the difference between step growth and chain growth. In step, clo uh, step growth, because each reaction occurs slowly and individually, it takes a long time to form polymers. 
in chain growth, because you invoke very high energetic species, the polymer forms really, really fast within milliseconds, right at the beginning of the reaction. And then you just form more and more polymers in the course of the reaction. But in step growth, again, you form polymers, but only very late in the reaction. So it's a very important difference. Okay, so this is um, maybe a more simplistic picture of this. Of course, we have an initiator. This is the high energy species, and we simply add materials to this. Now you see the chains become bigger and bigger. This is the chain growth principle. You have one living species, and you add to this. And the step growth, oh, sorry, this is typical monomers that we can polymerize with this. If you look at this list, certainly a non-exhaustive list, you will realize one thing. The monomers all contain double bonds. So the double bond is the chemical species that can be polymerized by a radical polymerization. So if you want, this is um, a bond or a molecule that is, if you want, stupid enough to catch this hot bullet, so it's susceptible to um, being attacked by a radical, and then it's also able to transfer this radical really fast to the next person. And here is again this what I showed you before. Step growth is people holding hands, and here you have this chain that propagates through the material and then makes very quick polymerization process. So if we now take this principle and we plot the formation of molecules or of polymers, the degree of polymerization, and this is if you want, related to the molecular weight of the polymers as a function of the conversion of monomers or of time. Then you see that in step growth, we get this characteristic growth pattern predicted by Carrotha's equation. But in chain growth, at the very beginning, as soon as one radical is present, I form a large polymer. The second one will also form a large polymer, the third one as well, and so on. So each radical right at the beginning of the reaction forms a long polymer chain. So this is the relationship of monomer conversion over molecular weight. For a radical polymerization and for a step growth. Very different behavior indeed. Okay, so now this makes, of course, a big difference, and we will discuss a little bit more why people will um, choose step growth by itself at all. But first, let's look at the free radical polymerization in more detail. So we've seen that is it on? we've seen that we need double bonds. And now let's look at how this looks like. So we have a molecule. And this double bond can catch a radical and pass it on to form a polymer. And what happens in the course of this reaction is that we convert a double bond via an initiator to a polymer. So a double bond is converted into a single bond. And you see that um, And you will see, if you look at the energy, that this generates, well, this um, makes the molecule energetically more stable. So it's an exothermic reaction. We gain energy from this reaction. Now let's look at how this works. So we have a radical here. And 
this attacks this double bond and we form the next species. And we'll look into this in, in more detail in a second. Just what I want to do is a very quick back of the envelope calculation about the energetic situation. Here we have one sigma bond. So a single bond here. And here we have one pi bond, so a double bond. And this sigma bond, if you look at Wikipedia, for example, or in a textbook, you will see this has 348 kilojoule per mole in energy. While the double bond, of course, it's energetically um, higher because this is more electrons that are in binding pairs. And this has 614 kilojoule per mole. So in sum, these two have 962 kilojoule per mole in binding energy at this stage. Now, after this double bond has been added to the polymer chain. On this side here, we have now, hang on, one, two, and three single bonds. Now this is the newly formed bond, and now we have three sigma bonds, because one pi bond has been converted into a sigma bond. So if you do the math, this would be three times three, four, eight kilojoule per mole. And this is 1,044. So energetically speaking, after polymerization, there's more binding energy in the polymer. Hence, it is an exothermic reaction, and it runs spontaneously. And this is also the reason why this molecule, this double bond, actually goes through the pain of catching this hot um, ball or catching the radical to become higher in energy because at the end of the reaction, it decreases in energy. Okay, this is the trick. This is why, why it works. We convert pi bonds into sigma bonds. And then let's have another quick look at how such a radical looks like. Maybe over here. So a, a pi bond, if we, a double bond, if we look at this here, now this molecule lays flat in the plane of the blackboard, and a double bond has these two orbitals now in the plane. So this one, these two bonds is the pi bond, and this here is the sigma bond. The pi bond always is vertical to the molecular axis. And now, if we convert this into a sigma bond, this contains two electrons here. If we convert this into a sigma bond and one radical is left, so in this situation, then we suddenly have a situation where There's one more, one more bond here. This is the new sigma bond, this one here. And there's one radical left at the molecule, which is this one here. And this radical, if you take out one um, electron from the pi bond, then obviously the second electron will still reside in an orbital that corresponds to this pi orbital of the double bond. And this is, since it's not a molecular orbital anymore, we don't call it a pi orbital, but a p orbital. So from this, we learned that a radical sits in a pi orbital, uh, sits in a p orbital. So this is fairly important, and please take this in mind. It will explain some of the features of the radical polymerization, how it proceeds in a second. Okay, so take home message, exothermic reaction, and the radical resides in a 
pi orbital. So now, having clarified the principles of this reaction, so this is what you see here, we look at how the reaction proceeds. And there is three, possibly four, distinct steps of a radical polymerization. First, we need to generate the radical. That's how everything starts. So if you want, heat up the metal ball. This is generation of radical species, and we then form an active chain. Then we have a propagation event. That means that the radical very rapidly penetrates from one double bond to the next, and in its wake forms a polymer chain. And finally, all good things come to an end. There's a termination. This corresponds to the smart person that just drops the hot ball, and then the radical dies, if you want, terminates. And we will see how this actually happens. There's another thing that can happen, which is known as chain transfer. That means that the radical jumps from one chain to another, or from one part of the chain to another, and we will discuss this in a second. So the one side of the polymer dies, but it continues somewhere else. OK, now let's go through the individual reaction steps of a radical polymerization and look at some details. So first, we need to initiate the reaction to form a radical species. And in order to do this, there's multiple ways how exactly we can do this. But very generally or very often, you somewhat need to cleave a sigma bond, a single bond that splits up in two equal parts and then generates two radicals. And very typically, Very typically, we need to convince a molecule to do this. No, because molecules tend to be more or less stable at room temperature, and we need to give it a little kick so that the weakest, bonds in the weakest bond in the molecule breaks up. And this little kick can either be done by so thermal treatment. That means temperature goes up. We can use UV light. which we call H nu. So we shoot a, uh, a photon at the bond, make the bond wiggle, and then it can fall apart. Or we can use redox chemistry. Meaning that we apply, um, we oxidize something, or we provide an electron to a molecule, and this then leads to the rupture of a bond and the formation of a radical. And often, very typical processes, are the following. So we need to identify a bond that can break fairly easily. And one such a system are pair oxides, where we have a system that looks kind of a molecule that looks something like this. Now if we apply energy, and we can rupture this bond here, and we will form two oxygen radicals. And these can then initiate the polymerization. And the other option that we have, are one typical other options, there's of course more, 
then one are diazo molecules. And they look as follows. We have some organic rest. And then we have a nitrogen um, bonding here, followed by a second organic rest. And I will give you two um, examples of these different processes by itself. So now here is maybe a little bit less clear where the weak bond is. But what we can identify is that nitrogen in its molecular form has a triple bond and is extremely stable and inert. So there will always be a tendency of this molecule to form a nitrogen bond. This also has two electron lone pairs. So if you rattle this molecule by applying thermal energy, um, photons, and so on, you can break these two bonds, form a radical here, and these radicals will combine to form the third bond of the nitrogen atom. So now we are left with two organic radicals. and nitrogen as a gas. Okay, these are very typical formation mechanisms for radicals. Now I will give you three examples of these um, three ways to generate radicals and two of them will be these classical peroxide and diazo compounds. So this is what we've seen here. So the first one that can be initiated for example thermally is benzoyl peroxide. Here we have a peroxide, you see this here and the peroxide kind of consists of these two benzoyl structures. So if we apply thermal energy, the weakest bond yields. We create two benzoyl oxy radicals here. And now, in this special case, this can slightly rearrange. You can see there's already kind of a CO2 that emerges as a structure here. So if this radical flips in, then this bond can break to provide the second um, electron for this second carbonyl bond of the CO2, we generate CO2 and now we have a phenyl radical that starts the reaction. Okay, and the second one would be AIBN, a very classical polymer polymerization initiator, which is azo bis isobutyro nitrile. So this is the azo component here, and those are these isobutyro nitrile. Okay, so again, now in this case, this is photosensitive. We identify the weak link as the one next to the nitrogen atoms. And here you see this um, uh, nitrile functionality pulls on the electrons, so polarizes this bond a bit to make it easier to break apart. Now if you do this, you break here and here. As before, you generate molecular nitrogen and these two radicals that can then be controlled. So now you already see here the advantage of using UV light or using light compared to heat is that you have a much better way to dose the intensity. If you heat something up, it takes forever to cool down again, so you can never really stop and start very easily. In the contrary, light, you switch on, it starts to form radicals, you switch off, it instantly stops. So it's much more precise to dose and much easier to, to kind of handle. And the second thing is you can also pattern it spatially. No, it's not so easy to heat one part of the substrate and not the other one, but it's very easy to put a mask on it and then just expose certain areas to light while um, keeping others in the dark and not initiating polymerization. So whenever you need to confine your polymers in a spatial way, light is the way to go for. Okay, the last example that I want to discuss with you are redox initiations. And here you see the advantage is that the radical can be formed at very mild conditions. So typically you don't need high temperatures to do a redox reaction and also you don't need to apply UV light. And now this, you can imagine if you have sensitive monomers, maybe monomers that contain very complex groups or um, anything that can be labile, then it's very hard to heat them up because they may decompose. And they could also be, let's say they contain maybe a dye, a fluorescent dye or so, then they could be destroyed by UV light as well. And then you need to kind of circumvent these rather harsh conditions and a redox initiation could be the right um, way of initiating the polymerization to make sure that your monomer is not being destroyed in the process.
So how does this work? Here's an example, cumul hydroperoxide, a molecule that looks like this, and you can react this with iron 2 plus, and this iron 2 plus can be oxidized to iron 3 plus, so you gain one electron. This electron can be added to this bonding situation, and that means that you can create a hydroxyl ion, which is a stable species. Now you break the bond here, and you add one more electron here, and what you're left with is this cumul oxy radical. And this then can initiate the polymerization. Okay, so now we have a radical. The next thing to look for is what happens when the radical propagates. And in order to look at this, let's first assume we have our radical here. So strictly speaking, typically you consider the very first step when the radical from the initiator attacks the first monomer still as part of the initiation, because then you have a radical species that looks the same, and this will then propagate all the way through. For the sake, for our purposes, it doesn't really matter too much. We say we have a radical here, and we don't really worry too much about in detail how this looks like. It just makes it a bit easier to treat. And now, this radical can do two things. Say we have um, a double bond that contains an organic rest here. It can either attack the double bond, that's something that we know, and it, it can attack it from here or from here. So it can form A, <coughs> a molecule that looks like this, or it can attack it here, and then it will, form, will open the bond in the other direction. And the same is true, of course, if this is already an entire polymer chain that propagates. Now then, it keeps going on and on. But let's first see which one is um, the energetically preferred state. So judging from everything I told you before about where the radical sits, how the radical reacts and so on, what would you think is the more energetically favored way of adding the radical? So will it form mostly this way or will it form mostly this way? Take a second to look at this and then I will tell you that this one here is preferred. And there's two arguments for this. The first argument is relatively simply. It's a sterical argument. If R is bulky, then there is just more space to add it to the side without substituents. Unsubstitute. Okay, so more space for the radical to go here. If it goes here, there may be clashes between these two, and this is the static argument. The second argument is an energetic argument. And this has to do with where the radical sits. So if you again look at how we can picture the situation. Let's first look maybe at this side here. If we have our rest here in direct vicinity of the electron, 
uh, of the electron in the radical. So we have our polymer chain here. So we have a CH and now our H and here our rest and our radical sits in this p orbital. So if our rest here has electrons to share, and I give you an example that's maybe uh, kind of the most widely, or the most, the clearest um, argument, if R would be for R equals um, a phenyl rest. So if this is a benzene ring, then we have a benzene ring that is now in this area. And that means the benzene ring has two orbitals of the aromatic rings that are in plane with the pi orbital. And these, let's make them a little bit thicker. So these orbitals also are now in this plane here, similar to this one. And now we have an interaction between the two lobes of the p orbital and the lobes of the aromat that lies in the same plane. between R and P orbital of the radical. So for the aromatic ring, I think it's maybe clearest to see. The same is true if you just have a CC bond, because this can also stand in the same direction, and then the P orbital can overlap with the sigma orbital of anything that points upwards. But it cannot do this if you don't have any rest, because here there's only bonds in this direction, so in plane. There is no additional orbital around that goes um, along the blackboard plane, so in the same direction as the p orbital. So you need a substituent that sits in vicinity of the orbital where the radical is in, in order to provide this overlap. And this overlap then causes a delocalization of electron density, and this lowers the energy. And for these two reasons, is it always preferred to have this attack at the end of the molecule, so or the, of the double bond, so that the radical forms directly in vicinity of the um, substituent R. Okay, and now when this happens, then of course the reaction can propagate more and more. So we now have. Um, so C, C, and the rest. We'll then go This will then propagate more and more, and we will form something that looks like this. So this is really how our polymer forms. And again, as I said, Predominantly, we have this head-to-tail addition that the polymer forms in a way that the radical is next 
to the rest. Not exclusively, of course, because it's not a black and white world, but this is just the energetically favorable way of doing this. Okay, so this is how the radical now forms. More and more monomers are being added. And now we need to consider how the radical terminates. So when does the reaction stop? And in order to do this, we need to invoke a second radical. So eventually two radicals meet, and then we will see what happens if they do so. So let's see, two radicals meet and we will see how they can terminate. There's two possibilities. The first one is known as recombination. And this is a fairly simple process. We have two polymer chains that contain a radical. They diffuse around in solution where they come very close. Of course, these are two unpaired electrons. And once they merge, they can form a chemical bond. So this is how um, a termination by recombination occurs. The second one is called disproportionation. And this is the typical mechanism that occurs if we have more, um, methyl groups right next to the radical. Alpha methyl vinyl monomers. And a very typical example of this is MMA, methyl methaculate, which makes plexiglass. So, a very um, often find a very widely used polymer. So, here you see this alpha methyl component. So what happens in this case? We have a polymer chain that has our radical here, any functional group R here, in this case, for example, this methyl ester, and we have a CH3 group here. And the same radical 
meets this. Now for this type of situation, it's much more diff difficult for these two radicals to find each other because they are much more buried in the steric shielding of the methyl group and of the other rest, whatever this may be. So it's not unlikely that the radical first comes in contact with a hydrogen that is in this methyl group, no? because it, it sticks out as the first point of contact. So in this case, the radical can attack the, H, uh, the hydrogen here. And maybe let's add a chemical bond here. So this will grab the hydrogen, split this bond up, and form a single bond to the hydrogen here, while the second bond, or the second um, electron in this bond, can form a double bond with this one here. So at the end of the reaction, we are left with one molecule. Uh, sorry. That has a CH3 group here, and a single bond to an H. It's this one here, and the other one has a double bond. Here. And this is why we call it a disproportionation, because the electrons are not equally split, but distributed into a single bond and a double bond. OK, these are two equal mechanisms how, after the reaction, as you can see here, no radical is present anymore. OK, finally, there's one last thing that can happen. And this is a chain transfer. And this chain transfer can occur. Well, what this means is that the radical is being transferred from the growing polymer chain to a new species. So we have a polymer chain here. And we have a certain molecule. And we call this, just for the sake of it, TA for transfer agent. This is a molecule that can easily kind of split this bond here. So what can happen is that this bond splits up, meets with this radical here, and we are left with the polymer. And a new radical. So as a consequence here, this chain is terminated. But the overall situation is not a dead situation as in the termination, because we have a new, a new radical here. So what can be the chain transfer agent? Well, it could be a small molecule. For example, the initiator. So you can use one of these radicals to split up an, an initiator, terminate the reaction, and then release the second part of the initiator. But it could be a solvent, depending on what type of solvent you use. This can happen more or less often. If you use chloroform, for example, this works very efficiently. Where you can split your molecule here, and then you terminate the reaction with this H, and you have a new CCl3. radical, but this is typically not preferred because if you have so many chain transfer agents, then you will not really form efficient polymers anymore. But you can also use this as an additive. And this allows you to control the molecular weight. Now, the more of this additive you add, the more chains will be earlier terminated and new chains will 
um, will start to grow. So you can control the resulting molecular weight. And what can also occur is chain transfer to polymer chains. And this can be either intramolecular, so the radical can be transferred within the polymer, or intermolecular, so the radical can be transferred to a second polymer. And this is much easier to show on the slide than on the blackboard, so I will move over. So we talked about all this. This is the termination reaction. Now we have this chain transfer reaction. And here is the example for intramolecular chain transfer. And here you see this is a polymer chain, in this case an ethylene chain. Here is the active end. And if it forms a six-membered ring here, there is no ring tension, so quite naturally, because the polymer chain is flexible, it can get in contact with um, hydrogen atoms that are bound to the polymer, but a little bit further in the chain. Whenever you have a six-membered ring, what can happen, similar to the um, reaction in the disproportionation reaction, that this radical attacks the hydrogen here, this bond splits up, and suddenly you have the radical sitting here. And this is typically four chains in the back. And now it can start to polymerize a bit more, and then do the same thing again, no? because now you have another six-membered rings, and suddenly you find the radical in two um, C atoms um, after the quorum chain. So however this works, what you see is that this chain transfer always occurs by forming six-membered rings, because this is the easiest, um, or the easiest position for the radical to accidentally hit its own backbone. So it will always give rise to small side chains. Very important, if you polymerize ethylene in a free radical polymerization, you cannot avoid that you get a certain amount of side chains in your polymer because of this intramolecular chain transfer. Okay, so this will always lead to what is known as low density polyethylene, ethylene LDPE. If you want to do high density polyethylene, as I already said in the introductory slide, you need to modify your reaction conditions and typically use a catalyst to do the polymerization. Good, okay, and the second way the chain transfer can happen is among different polymer chains. So here you have polymer chain one with an active chain end. Here is polymer chain two, whether or not this is active or not is not important. But if this hits the second polymer chain, it can also abstract an H here, a proton, cleave this bond here, and then you're left with a new radical somewhere within the polymer chain. And now this, of course, can continue to grow, and these ones will then be very long side chains. So this means that in this case, intermolecular chain transfer leads to long side chains. Okay, so now digest a little bit these mechanistical insights of the polymers, and now we, will, we want to discuss some synthetic aspects of radical polymer chemistry. You've seen the double bonds already I showed you, or monomers with a double bond. Now you can already think for yourself what kind of polymers can be formed with a radical polymerization, where do we know them from, and what do we need them for.
So let's see, synthetic aspects of free radical polymerization. So now I'm going to show you some chemical structures and you can now think for yourself what the name of this polymer could be. Keep in mind what we discussed in the very first lecture, how we can identify this. So the trick is we need to come from the polymer structure to the monomer structure and then we know the monomer then we add a poly in front of it and we know the polymer. So what is this one here? Here we can identify that this is the core unit of the polymer. So the monomer must be a structure that has a double bond in the middle here and no connection here. So clearly this must be ethylene. So the polymer is polyethylene. And again, you've seen what we used it for in the very first lecture for quite a lot of things, including uh, all kinds of moldable objects, plastic bags, wrapping paper, toys, um, bags, and so on. What is this one here? So again, we cut the bonds here, we add a double bond. We see that this is tetrafluoroethylene. So the polymer is polytetrafluoroethylene or PTFE. And we know this as Teflon. So either in your pen or as Gore-Tex water repellent clothing and so on and so forth. So anything that repels water is chemically very inert and so on. This fellow here, now do this for yourself and see what comes out. Little hint, it will make very cheap and moldable objects. And finally, this one here, you've seen it in the first lecture as well. We cut the double bonds. We see that it comes out as vinyl chloride. And this is known as general vinyl recordings or as PVC, polyvinyl chloride, which is made for um, floors and scratch resistant materials. Okay, so now we play the game the other way around. We know that polymethyl methacrylate is used in transparent windows, for example, in the hockey stadium, in airplanes and so on. And now the question is, how does it look like? So how do we do this? We identify the monomer, which is methyl methacrylate, which looks like this. Once we have this, we convert the double bond into single bonds. And this will be the polymer. Similarly, polylauryl methacrylate, we modify this methyl group here to a very long polymer chain, so it will look like C12H25, polyacrylates are materials that come from acrylic acid that looks like this. So it will be convert this into a single bond. And finally poly what was it polyacrylonitrile. We need to know what acrylonitrile is. This looks like this. And this will form a polymer that looks like this. Okay, what do we uh, use them for? This is a very soft material, then it's used in coatings. Polyacrylates, we will discuss in much more detail a little bit later. Ah, super absorbers, so diapers and so on. And polyacrylonitrile, this fellow here can be converted by high, at high temperatures into carbon fibers. So this is what your tennis racket, your canoe, your um, very expensive bike, possible aircraft and so on are made from. Now very, actually very simple chemistry, but then a little bit of an elaborate thermal treatment to come into this. Okay, now with this, I want to wrap up and ask you, what are the major differences between a step growth and the chain growth polymerization. Think about this and recapitulate in your head what the differences are in terms of the synthesis, in terms of the chain growth, and so on and so forth.
evolution of molecular weight. Chain growth goes very fast and you form high molecular weight components very early on in the reaction. Step growth, you need to wait for a long time and for a high conversion to do this. Choice of monomers. For chain growth, you always need vinyl polymers, so you can only polymerize double bonds, while in step growth, you have a pretty large um, variety of monomers you can polymerize. Very important is where are the functional groups? In step growth, you have the functional groups in the backbone, and as I said already multiple times, this increases the adhesion between um, the polymer chains, so the affinity, because they can form hydrogen bonding and so on, and this can make the material much more uh, mechanically stable. Now, this is why a lot of high performance polymers are from step growth. In contrast, in our radical polymerizations, the functional groups are inherently in the side chains. And the application of the resulting polymers kind of feeds back into this very often. Um, radical polymerization yields rather cheap plastics, while the other one yields rather expensive and high performance plastics. Okay, so now let's move on to pretty much the last chapter for today. Now we want to look at the kinetics of free radical polymerization. And especially what we want to do is get predictive models that tell us how long our polymers will get or what we can expect from the polymer uh, chain length, molecular weight, and so on, as a function of how much initiator do I put in, how many monomers do I put in, and so on and so forth. And secondly, we want to know how fast the reaction proceeds as a function of these two parameters as well. Okay, so that's pretty much what, you, what, what I just said. We want to predict the reaction time, we want to know the weight constants, we want the molecular weight, and of course, we want to do, or we can use this as a quality control. Now, if we expect a certain chain length and we do not find this, then we know that apparently something else must be going on in our reaction. So it can be very important knowledge to be generated to know what is going on in the reaction. Okay, in order to do this, what we need to do is first define kind of our target, and then we need to go through all the individual steps and see uh, or find kinetic equations for those. And this is what we now quickly want to do on the blackboard. So first, we are interested in the rate of polymerization. RP And we define this rate as the consumption of monomers. So how fast do I convert monomers into a polymer? Minus dm over dt. And the second thing that we want to know is the degree of polymerization. And the degree of polymerization we want to know because we are interested in how long our polymer chains get. And we approximate this by what is known as the kinetic chain length. So Vn is just kind of the kinetic chain length. And what this means is simply how fast do I add monomers to a growing polymers as compared to how fast I terminate. So the faster the rate of propagation compared to the rate of termination, the more monomers I can add in the time span of one typical termination event. So this means this would be... Um, rate of addition versus rate of termination. Now this for the time being looks a little bit bulky and a lot of text, but you will see soon how we can uh, mold this into an equation. So now do we, how do we get to these different properties? First, we look at the different steps of the polymerization. So first, 
call it one initiation. And there we have an initiator molecule that is being converted into typically two radicals. So the rate of initiation equals the formation of radicals over time and that is 2 ki i radicals. So the formation of radicals is of course proportional to the concentration of initiator. The more initiator, the more radicals we form. And we have this factor 2 here because we form two radicals per um, initiation step. So secondly, we look at the propagation. And propagation occurs by having a certain monomer radical that can be that has a certain number of well, a polymer chain that has a certain number of mono, monomers and is a radical. Now this is something like and this I would indicate how many monomers we have in this chain. And this adds another monomer to form a new chain that is a little bit longer, mi plus one radical. So now how do we define this? Rp is, as we've already seen here, this is the rate of polymerization because this is the step where the polymer is actually formed. So it's minus dm over dt, so the consumption of monomers. And now we need to take into account that there's a lot of different reactions going on here. So we have dm over dt is the first step, so rate constant of the polymer times m1 radical times m plus Kp m2 radical m and so on until mi radical types monomer. And we assume that the constant is the same for all different chain lengths simply because the mono monomer can very easily diffuse to a chain, to a radical, however long the polymer chain is. Okay, and this goes on and on and on plus Kp mi radical m. And now we can simplify this. Let me clear up a little space here. So here we have this Kp m1 radical times m plus plus Kp mi radical times m. So we can express this as the sum over all different radicals. So this would be Kp times m times the sum over i equals 1 till infinity mi. So we got this of the length of the polymer chain. And just to make my life a little bit easier with, with write, writing, I define this simply by calling it m radical. And with this m radical, I don't specify how long the chain is. So it's simply a polymer chain, however long, that has a radical. Okay, And this give, will give me the rate constant. So now, finally, I need to look at the termination reaction.
they have two distinct modes of termination. So I have two M radicals. And either it forms Mi, Mj, or you could also say it's a polymer that is, contains these two. Or, so this would be a termination by recombination, or it terminates by this proportionation and then forms an Mi plus Mj, or if you can also say this is a polymer Pi plus Pj. Okay, so now we can get our kinetic equation here. So in this case, we look at the decrease in M radical concentration over time. And this will be 2, one of these constant here, KT R times M So this is m squared because we have these two different components and a two here because we, it takes two of these monomers to form one of the polymers. Okay, And we have our second mode, 2KTD times mi, mi. And now we make our life even simpler and saying we don't really care how it terminates and make one rate constant for determination that sums up these two. 2kt, so we got this, the, mono, the radical disappears, that's all that counts, um, radical squared. Okay, so now we're pretty much at the end, but we are facing a trouble here. What we want to do is we want to calculate the rate of polymerization minus dm over dt, which we have here, but we can only right now express it as a function of the monomer concentration, which is nice, but also as a function of the radical concentration. And that's not very easy for us to know. And rather, we would have uh, kinetic equations that predict this speed of reaction as a function of the initiator concentration. And likewise, in the kinetic chain lengths, we have the rate of addition, so this one here, and the rate of termination, and both of them are functions of this M radical concentration. And we need to get rid of the radical concentration to get meaningful predictions. So in order to do this, we need to do a little trick. And what we imply is a so-called steady state principle. So let me call this maybe problem. We need to get rid of or need to replace So we do a trick. Steady state. And the steady state says that throughout most of the reaction, except for the very beginning part and the very end part, the amount of radicals in our reaction remains the same. So the rate of formation of new radicals is similar to the rate of termination. And matter of factly, this is very justified if you measure the um, heat of reaction and if you look at the reaction in detail, you see that it's actually true. So it will always run into an equilibrium. You form radicals, it polymerizes, eventually they die, they die out. Then you form more um, radicals, they die out again. And if you do this long, long enough, of course, it kind of mixes and these um, reactions or these um, uh, these two modes of forming and of terminating radicals will be the same. Of course, in the beginning, that's not true because you form radicals faster than they die because they need to die first. And at the end, it's also not true because the radicals may still be present um, while the initiator is completely gone. But this is very small time points over the course of reaction. So it's very justified to do this. So what we say is minus dm radical over dt, so the rate of disappearance of radicals is the same as the formation of radicals. <laughs>
And now we can plug in our equation. We know that radicals disappear by termination. 2 kt m radical squared. <coughs> and radicals are formed by initiation. So 2 ki i. And this now allows us to express the radical concentration by the initi initiator concentration. And this is exactly what we need to have. So now we can do the math, kick out this one here, divide by this kt, and it will be ki over kt times i concentration of initiator to the power of one half. Okay, this is very essential. And now we are at the end of our excerpt. So I put this up here again. This is what we need. Rp and xn. And I make some space so that we can find, finish this off. So now, Rp, rate of polymerization. We still have this here. Rp equals minus dm over dt. And then we found that this is now, I unfortunately deleted already, minus dm over dt. And we saw that this was Kp times m times m radical. So now we can finally replace m radical by ki over kt times i to the power of one half. So this is now Or in short, Rp is proportional to the concentration of monomers, and Rp is also proportional to the concentration of the initiator to the power of one half. So I, if I add more initiator, my reaction will speed up. And now we look at the expression for the kinetic chain length, or the degree of polymerization. And this is the rate of addition of monomer, so um, minus dm over dt, now the reduction of monomer, so this would be kp m m radical divided by the rate of termination, and this was kt times m radical squared, so we get rid of one m radical, over kt times m over m radical. Again, this is our trouble, uh, troubling spot because we cannot uh, know the concentration of radicals so well. But again, we can replace it by this expression that we got from the steady state principle. And this will then be kp times m divided by Two, and now I put the kt directly into this bracket, so this would be kt squared, and then I can cut it out, so it would be two times ki kt times i to the power of one half. So, and now we are done with the kinetics. Let's again see what we found here. Typically, we want to make 
polymers as fast as possible you know, because we are greedy capitalists and as good as possible because we still believe in good quality of our products. And typically, the longer the polymer chains, the better their mechanical properties and so on and so forth. So our problem now is we cannot have it both. If we want to increase the rate of reaction, as we said, we need to increase the initiator concentration. Now, however, if we want to make polymers that are very long and therefore of high quality, we need to decrease the initiator concentration because this scales with to the power of minus one half. And this is known as the radical dilemma. And maybe it also teaches an important lesson in life. You cannot have it all. No, either you make it fast or you make it good. Very true for the radicals here. But now you might say, well, wait a minute. This is not entirely true. We have a second handle to play with. If we increase the monomer concentration, we increase the speed of reaction. And if we increase the monomer concentration, we increase our chain length or our molecular weight. So maybe there is a free lunch, there is a possibility to have it both, fast and high quality products. Well, and now I invite you to, if you have a lab, to go there and try it, but we can also see what happens. And this will be the final point of this lecture. And what you will see is what happens when you become over greedy. So now you try to wrap up your process and you add where you increase the monomer concentration more and more to make your polymers faster and faster. And then you see the following. So let's just click through this here. You will run into something that is known as the Tromsdorf effect. So this is an experiment here that I took from the textbook of Bernd Tieke, where you see conversion of monomers. So in a sense, an indication of how fast the reaction is over time. What you would expect is that a good approximation should be linear, something like this. And you see that eventually it starts to deviate from this because it becomes increasingly more difficult, the monomer is being consumed, and the reaction slows down a little bit. What you never want to see is a deviation in this direction because it means that at a certain time, you suddenly start to form monomers much, much quicker. And you see, in the beginning, it's not a problem, so this is kind of a very well-behaved reaction. If you increase the monomer concentration more and more, suddenly you come, it starts a little, it takes a while, and then you come into a regime where the monomer is really, really rapidly converted. Now you may say even better, so instead of having a linear effect of the monomer concentration, you get a much bigger effect. So if you want more bang for your buck. But what is happening, now we need to go back to the very beginning what we discussed. We have an exothermic reaction. So that means each conversion of a monomer to a polymer generates heat. So now, as the reaction proceeds, you heat up your reaction more and more. That converts more monomer to polymer, which increases the heat, and so on and so forth. So the reaction becomes faster and faster. And even more severely, the reaction also becomes much more viscous, right? because you form more and more polymers in less and less solvent when you come from here to here. And if the solution becomes viscous, diffusion of molecules becomes slower. And that means that two polymer chains that are very large and chubby need to diffuse around to, in order to terminate. And if the viscosity is too high, they cannot terminate anymore. While a small molecule can still diffuse relatively fast and can still add to the polymer chain. So both effects really bring the reaction rate higher and higher because of um, increase in heat and decrease in termination rate. And at the end of the day, this ends in a catastrophe because you release so much heat that the system cannot handle it anymore and re your reactor will explode. So this is a typical sign of something that is extremely dangerous because you release a lot of heat at a very short interval of time. And this is then the um, punishment you get for being too greedy by trying to outplay this radical dilemma via the monomer concentration.
So again, you see, we have an auto acceleration of polymerization because increase of reaction viscosity, we have a reduction of termination weight, and we cannot really control our exothermic reaction anymore. You also see this here, you know, the rate of polymerization and the degree of polymerization depends on the square root of the termination reaction. So if you decrease this, then this goes out of control. So a lesson learned, the radical dilemma is not so easily um, kind of over to overcome and we need to balance somewhat control of the reactivity with reaction speed with a desired molecular weight. One last word, how does the monomer actually come from the factory to my lab where I make the polymers or to the polymer factory? We know they are reactive, they can polymerize. If you heat them up, they may start to react. So it's a bit of a dangerous business to drive monomers around. And in order to do this, you add inhibitors or retarders. So to control the polymerization conditions, especially retarders, to make sure that nothing polymerizes before you want, want it to polymerize, inhibitors. So what you want to do is spe to add species that can capture a radical without initiating a polymerization. So you need to have something that forms a relatively stable radical so that if a radical appears, it can catch it, but then never release the radical again. And there's two or multiple possibilities where we often have these kinon, hydrokinon system. So you add this kinon here, and if you then create a radical here, which sorry is slipped out of the slide apparently, then it can catch this radical here, and this is stable enough that it will not initiate a new polymerization. So this is a molecule that you have in your monomer when you buy it from a supplier, and before starting a reaction, you need to remove it in order for your reaction to proceed normally. And oxygen can also work as a retainer or an inhibitor because it can form these peroxy radicals here. And this can be dangerous because if they start to react a bit more, then you have peroxide in your material and peroxides can also explode. So also there, care needs to be taken to remove oxygen from your reaction if you're making polymers. This is how it looks like, the conversion curve. So a normal conversion, as I said, you know, kind of looks like this over time. If you have a retarder, then you decrease the rate of reaction, so it's a little bit um, slower in speed. And an inhibitor will simply cause a delay time or an induction period where all the inhibitor is consumed. So you pretty much destroy inhibitor by adding um, initiator. If the inhibitor is completely saturated, then you have a normal polymerization. So these are the tricks to make polymers, if you want, or monomers handleable. All right, this brings me to the end of the lecture. Let us briefly recap. Polymerization of vinyl monomers is the typical thing that we do in a free radical polymerization, and it proceeds very fast. Now again, keep the hot, um, hot metal ball that propagates through the material in mind. The driving force is that we convert pi bonds and sigma bonds. It's an exothermic reaction, which again can be a problem if we increase the monomer concentration too much because we release too much heat. We can form very high molecular weights right at the beginning of the reaction, in big contrast to step growth polymerization, but we form functional groups only in the side chains. Well, then we looked at the kinetics of free radical polymerization. We saw that we can subdivide this into three steps, initiation, propagation, termination, and this allows us to, de to determine the speed of reaction or um, rate of reaction and the chain length. And finally, the Tromstoff effect is the auto-acceleration of the polymerization, which happens if you increase the monomer concentration too much. So with this, let us wrap up this chapter. I thank you very much for your attention and for watching, and wish you a good day. See you next time. Goodbye.